Thank you. Uh, no, it was, it's nice to come here. I had my 8 o'clock class, tree ID. Uh, I got over at 9, then I've got a class at 4 to 5.30 tonight. And the students from the afternoon class, well, are you sure you're going to make it back? Oh, yeah, we'll make it back. You know, you know, school's the only thing, the less you get, the happier you are. You know, I tell the students, somebody paid for you to go to class. You know, if I went into the movie theater halfway through, shut off the projector and said, everybody can go home, you'd be upset. How come with college and you don't, you know, we can't for class, you're happy about it. I don't get it. But anyway, thanks for being here today. Uh, what I'm going to give you is a very opinionated talk on problems with consoles. Right, because there's lots of problems with consoles. Uh, when I become king of the planet, I'm going to ban a lot of them from being sold. So let's get started here today here. And first of all, half the samples that come into my diagnostic lab from the state of South Dakota are in consoles. And in fact, almost all of them are on one particular convert. What is that convert? Blue spruce, there you go. That's the one that's going to be banned when I become king. <laughs> All right, because it has more problems than anything as you're going to go find it. Now, again, they look cute, but nevertheless, they have problems. But really, I get lots and lots of stuff coming into the lab. It be the cotton. Now, we use a lot of them for windbreaks, admittedly. Uh, and they are used in almost every ornamental uh, landscape, but still, we have problems. So I'm going to go through, and the master gardeners are certainly aware of this. When you get a call, someone says, what's wrong with my tree? Now, first of all, they want an instant answer, and they want a chemical solution. All right, everybody wants me to give them something they can spray. And unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do. So I'm going to go through the more common things. What's wrong with my conifer there? First of all, there's nothing wrong. We get lots of things. It's not a problem at all. I get calls on this every year. What, what's, what's wrong with my spruce tree, my pine tree, my juniper? It's got all this dust coming off. Well, yeah, I, I sure tree just having sex. All right? I didn't know they could do that. Sure enough, trees do. Uh, the other one that's a problem, why am I getting all these little bumps at the tips of my arborvitaes? Those are the male cones. All right? It happens every year, but you get people that go, well, it's got to be something wrong. Or right now, you know, the calls that are coming in, my phone shut off, but when I started again, people say, you know what, the needles are turning yellow on my tree. And I say, well, are the needles turning yellow on the outside of the tree or the inside of the tree? And you put it as well, let me go off the wall. Oh, it's the inside. Perfectly normal. Right now, the few sunny days we're getting, I took that picture yesterday at FDSU. You know, all our eastern white pines are in their glory with all those yellow interior needles. It's a normal process, it occurs every year. It also occurs on spruce, but you really need a dry, sunny fall for them to turn bright yellow. But we have had years where people call me because all the interior needles of their spruce are turning yellow as well, but it's perfectly normal. And it occurs on our providing too, but it's more of a ribbon through the plant. And I get called and recall, well, something's wrong with my arborvitaes. The needles are turning yellow in it. Well, it's kind of more of a ribbon rather than the interior. But yellow in the fall is fairly normal for a lot of these. Evergreen does not mean for evergreen. And they are going to shed their needles at, at a certain interval. Well, the other thing that's wrong, you didn't even know what it is. You know, we get a lot of people buy a house. And they didn't plant it, or we get people to plant things and then don't realize what they bought. So some of our problems is the plant's perfectly normal. You just didn't know it was supposed to do that. Uh, look at that. That is the golden Norway spruce. It's supposed to look that color. All right, I knew the people that planted it, so I knew the exact plant, but I got a call from the people who bought the house afterwards, and they've been giving it iron to turn it green. You can give it all the iron you want, but somebody paid extra for it to have that sickly color. So, you know, you got to also know what to plant it. Or this one. Anyone plant this one? I've got it kind of on your list. I have a list in alphabetical order, more or less, by a family. But this is Pinus Contorta Taylor Sunburst. And I'll leave it to you whether or not you like it. But every spring, it has all the new growth comes up, 
that kind of color. And it does fade to green as the season progresses. But I get people that plant these and they're giving it iron or manganese or fertilizer saying, well, what's wrong? It's got the sickly yellow color. Well, again, somebody paid to have a sickly yellow color. If you like that color, it's a pretty cool plant. But it does that every year. We have more and more cultivars of our, of our conifers that have unusual needle color. People are not aware. Or that one. You know, it's supposed to look like that. Not everybody likes it. It looks pretty good. It looks kind of a setup for Halloween or something like that. But that's a weeping white spruce. And then my absolute favorite, and I took this picture many years ago and digitized it, is that. <laughs> That is the columnar blue spruce. I took that pic picture in Fairville that I was working in Minnesota about 40 years ago, and I don't even know if the tree's still there. I'd go back and see if I can find it. But the thing I got a kick out of uh, taking a picture of that is the people that planted it still lived in that house. And they thought something was wrong with their tree and they check out. And I'm thinking, and it took you 40 years to call me. Now, I could just imagine that conversation with coffee on a Sunday. Do you think we ought to call somebody? Yep, we ought to do that. And 40 years later, then said, you know what? It never filled out the way we thought it would. <laughs> well, the thing you're going to do now is going to stay pretty, pretty narrow like that. It's supposed to look like that. It's a columnar blue spruce cultivar that looks like a sky rock. So sometimes you buy them and they look like this. Well, the other problem is sometimes it doesn't want to look different. That's a glow balsam fir. It's supposed to stay as a nice little beach ball. But one branch said, no, I want to be normal. And it's actually trying to grow a normal balsam fir above it. So we get these all the time where they revert back. A lot of our conifer mutations that we select as cultivars are not stable. They want to revert back and be a regular tree again. So what you have to do is anytime something looks normal on one of your dwarf conifers, you've got to kill that branch or it's going to take an over. Uh, how many plant these, these dwarf Alberta spruce? You know, people like them. Those are pretty big sizes. To get something five feet takes a long time to do it. But you know what? I get these. There's a dwarf Alberta spruce. What's wrong there? What do you see? One normal branch. Yeah, that mutation's going back. It says, I want to be normal. I don't want to be a mutant. And if you don't cut that branch off, what is it going to look like? It's going to look like that. All right? You lose it. So, you know, the big thing on these, you have to know what you have, all right, or, or take it into a master gardener. Uh, and have them figure out what it is. So sometimes we just have just a strange cultivar on this. But the other problem is sometimes they're just not happy. This is really not good conifer country. You got to go a little farther north than this to really get into good country there. I mean, if you want to see great conifers, go to Northern California, right on the coast. That's where every conifer wants to be. All right, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, not too dry, not too wet. It's a perfect place to be, and you can get big there, all right? But we're not there. Here, it gets too hot, it gets too cold, it gets too dry, it gets too wet, all right? So we have all the worst possibilities for climate. So, you know, we get lots of trees that aren't supposed to grow here. I mean, I get these sent to me every year. Oh, Dawn Redwood, will that grow here? Not for very long. It makes a pretty good annual, all right? But the first winter we're going to have, it's going to flat out die. Now, occasionally you get one that lives along. That one is actually in South Dakota, Yankton, South Dakota. And it lived for about 10 years before it realized it was in South Dakota and then just died, all right? So we get a lot of plants that they say they're hardy here, but they're really not. Because when you look, that's where you folks are at. You know, you're kind of in that zone 4A and 4B. Uh, the problem with zone maps, though, is zone maps were designed for the coast, not for the interior. And they work really good if you live in Maine or Massachusetts for that. Because what they base, base these maps on is really one thing, your average minimum temperature. Right? What they don't account for 
is temperature fluctuation. And we get those, don't we? It's warm one day, cold the next, warm the following day, really cold the next. Our temperatures go up and down. When I lived in Maine, they gradually got cold, they gradually got warm. We had this large body of water called the ocean that moderated the temperatures. So we could grow a lot more in zone four there than you can zone four here. So zone four here, you'll find a lot of plants that are listed as zone four. They're really not once you get out in the plains area like this. Uh, here was one, and by the way, a question mark means, eh, plant it if you're really a hobbyist and don't mind losing it. And I don't even have it on your list there, but this is Korean fir. That Korean fir was taken near Mankato, Minnesota, that picture. That's when I took that picture that was 45 years old and it was killed by a cold winter in the early 2000s. And it managed to live there that long. But it's not reliably hardy. If you live in the Twin Cities, which is a little heat island, you can grow it there. But that one winter, we lost every one of them on campus, despite the fact that some have been there for decades. And, that, and we lost them down in Mankato area, Waseca, and, and uh, Rochester. And that, so even the zone maps say it's really zone five. So we've been, we were pushing the envelope growing it here, but it had been mild enough for a long enough time. We had a few that got to some rather large size before they faded out. And they are beautiful plants. I mean, I love herbs. I mean, just those nice needles. And there's a real cool cultivar too. I love that. Look at that whiteness. Don't grow. It does not like it. I'll show you one on campus that somehow has managed to survive. That's it. Isn't that glorious? I mean, don't you all want something like that? <laughs> I mean, it looks half dead. I keep getting people say, why aren't you going to just put it out of its misery? And I say, well, no, we need it for flash for ID. But it doesn't form those nice specimens. Now, again, if you live in Edina, you can grow it. All right? Because you got that little urban heat island there, and it's all protected. So. But you don't have an urban heat, heat island here, at least not large enough one. Oh, white fir. I love that tree. And technically it's hardy enough to survive here. But what, it, what the zone maps don't account for too is our dry winter winds, which can really desiccate these plants here. I mean, think of our winters. We always get a January thaw, it always gets warm. We get windy, ground's still frozen, plants dry out. So this is what they often look like. That's one on our campus. And just the winters just destroy these plants. And so while it's hardy enough, this is what happens when you get a, a cold winter wind. All right, there's not much you can do about that in January or February. And so it's kind of on my naughty list. I don't really want to plant it because they don't do extremely well. Or arborvitaes either. In some cases, Arborvitaes are a native plant you'll find them farther north than here. In fact, they're at home really farther north here. But they do winter burn severely, many of the cultivars. And so you really got to be careful. There's two problems with these plants. One of them is they don't like our, our winter winds and they don't like de icing salts. Both will kill you. In fact, if you ever plant these next to a drive or something like that, where you're using de icing salts or near a road, you actually have to put a barrier. And the interesting thing with the de icing salts, and this might help you, is when we did our, our research, we found that the de icing salt problem wasn't that they're absorbing it through the roots. It wasn't that it was running off and absorbing through the roots. It was that the dried salts on the road and on your driveway becomes a dust and it's carried up and put on the needles and it damages the needles. And so my recommendation is if you've got these, you know, you don't need to really wrap them, but in the spring, hose them down before it gets warm and wash all that dust off them. And then you really don't have the problem. So just give them a bath, clean them up. But if you don't, you'll end up with a lot of winter burn in certain places, but it's what you pick that's important. This one right here is Rushmore Arborvitae. Uh, that was developed by South Dakota State University, of course. And that one, we've never seen any winter burn on it at all. It stays in a fairly tight column. That's in Macquarie Gardens. It gets about 40 uh, feet tall at maturity, but about four feet wide. Uh, if you want to sure keep it at 10 feet, you can indefinitely. 
but it's one of the ones that we found that actually handles our winters very nicely and by our winters are drying winter wind. Uh, I remember when I was working in Minnesota, I think it was 89, 87, we had a lot of drying winds that winter. And I was sitting at the Minnesota landscape meeting in January and we were already talking about how many Technion Arbor bodies everybody was going to replace because it was just an incredibly dry winter. So Arbor bodies can handle the cold. They don't like our winter winds, so if it's protected, they do well. And again, choosing the cold bar. And the Rushmore Arbor body is just one of the best. Uh, but unfortunately, one that isn't is the dwarf Alberta spruce. It does not like our winter winds at all. Which is kind of interesting because it's from Alberta. Well, Alberta's fairly far north. How the heck does it survive there? Well, Sargent found it. He was outside of a, a train station when he was out looking for plant material. Well, the reason it survived is it was always buried by three feet of snow. All right, and if you bury it by three feet of snow, it comes through just perfect. But if you've got an open winter, these winter burn incredibly fast. Now, by the way, it's an old myth to water your evergreens just before they freeze up. People <coughs> say, well, I'm gonna water them just before it freezes. That really doesn't do anything. The time to water these plants to really help them get through the winter is actually August and September. This year, we're pretty lucky. It rained a lot. And so we're in pretty good shape. But when we have dry summers, I'm always telling you, start watering in August. Start with August and September. Don't give them a drink just before the water, the soil freezes. Do it early. Notice my question mark here. Norway spruce I like, and if we were down by Albert Lee or further east, I'd say sure. But when you start getting up in this country, our winter winds are still a problem. This is what I call an in-town only plant. If you said, John, I want to grow one and I live right in, uh, more. So I'd say, sure, go ahead. But if you say, no, I live out on the farm and I'm thinking of making a windbreak out of these, no. They do winter burn. The other problem is they get really tall. One of the problems we found in Minnesota is they'll get about 50 feet and then the top will snap out of it because of the winds as well. So nice tree. It's got the grandfather-like uh, clock cones. And if you say, well, I live in town, sure, go ahead. And for this group here, for the most part, by the time it's 50 feet tall, you're not going to be around anyway. So it's really not an issue to you. All right. You know, being old has its advantages. Somebody else can deal with the busted top. All right. Now, now, why am I covering a ginkgo today? Because it's a conifer. All right. Uh, my students don't know that either, but they've even had that in lecture. So I had to cover it because technically it's a conifer. And, but it's a broadleaf conifer. They're nice trees. They don't get to be big trees out here. They get to be maybe 15, 20 feet tall. Occasionally I see a bigger one. But the problem we have with ginkgos is not our winter cold, not our desiccating winds because they don't have leaves during the winter. It's our early frosts. Our frosts come too early for this tree. I mean, they have these beautiful fan-shaped leaves that you'll never see anything chewing on them because they're really are very well defended. Nothing can attack them and live. So it's good. But that's why you plant them. You'll never see that in your life. All right, why your frosts come too early? When I worked out in Boston, they turned beautiful colors like this because our falls were very, very long. But here, the frosts come too early, so they don't have time to have their colors change. When I talked to Dale Herman up at North Dakota State University about this too, and we came to a rough guess that about one in 20 years, we have a long enough fall that will actually get the color. And we had that about two years ago, about as good as it got. But when you read about all the spectacular fall color on these, and you go, wait a minute, just keeps dropping green, our frost come. And if we get those late frosts, they can be great trees. I mean, that's the way they should look. I mean, that's magnificent. Man, I want one bad. Uh, but for us, oops, that's about as good as it gets. That's a game to at South Dakota State University. Not very happy for being there. And that's the best fall color we ever got on, was a couple of years ago. 
and that's certainly nothing to write home about. But still, it was nice. If you go out east too, they have a what? They often do this. They'll drop all their leaves within about a 24-hour time period. And when I worked out in Massachusetts, someone from the Boston Globe would take a picture of the ginkgo in the, in the commons, and they just take it every day in the fall. Because they'd get one day in cold leaves, a tree 70 feet, feet tall, next day just buried in leaves. I mean, wouldn't you like that for all your trees? One day they just drop all the leaves, you're done. Uh, this one would do it out east. It doesn't do it here. They just kind of pathetically drop the leaf here or there. Now, Siberian larch I like. Now, you have tamarack here. That's native, right? But tamarack's an okay tree. Not quite as pretty as the Siberian. There's two things I like about the Siberian. Notice it's got a smiley face there. And it does have great fall color, but your tamaracks do too. We can kind of grow European larch here. You can kind of, but again, it's, it's not on my happy list. Uh, but we even have problems over in uh, Clear Lake, which is certainly south of here, really getting them to do well there. Siberian larch, take a look at the zone map on that. It's actually a zone two tree. I mean, I don't care how cold it gets where you live, you will not get winter kill on that tree. The problem with larches, though, is their summers are too hot. And so tamarack really doesn't mind our cold, but it really doesn't like our heat. The nice thing with Siberian larch is from Siberia, another large body. And a lot of that is not near water. So this thing will take the heat and will take the cold. Now, you can't get a South Dakota to grow this for nothing. North Dakotas will grow it left and right. How come South Dakotas don't like it? A lot of Minnesotans don't like it. Because in the winter, it looks like a dead spruce. <laughs> all right, it doesn't have a single needle on it. All right, you accept all of your maples and oaks and all that looking dead all winter. Well, you know what, plant a few of these. It's really a nice tree. We use them as windbreaks in South Dakota, kind of as an ash substitute. Very fast growth rate for a conifer. And we'll take our heat and take our cold. And they'll tolerate dryness too. So it's a great tree, except it drops its needles and looks dead. But well, what about warm temperatures? I don't know if you've ever seen these maps here. I mean. You know, if the temperature's getting warmer during the summer, sooner or later you're gonna have a climate at Des Moines. All right, so what about warm temperatures? Well, that causes a problem too. I don't know how many of you have looked at the heat sub map that's been produced. You all know we have the plant hardiness map, but there's also a heat sub map. How many days do you have with temperatures above 85? Because 85 is kind of a threshold. A lot of us don't like temperatures above 85. We don't tend to like temperatures above 85, neither do plants. And so if you take a look at that, and they don't really have it refined yet to look at woody plants, but here is a very sad balsam fir growing in, oh, what a name, Faith, South Dakota. All right, and it is living on Faith because it's not that the winters are too cold there, the summers are too hot, that's Western South Dakota. I mean, you know, they had me out there, so what's wrong with my tree? I'm standing there, it's 105 degrees. It's baking. Every day the temperature is above 85, this tree's going backwards. All right, so a lot of our trees, I love firs, but we have two problems with firs. Winters are too cold, summers are too hot. Oh, and the one I hate. If, if today I convinced one of you not to plant another blue spruce, my life has been worth living. All right, this tree is a real problem, child. I mean, there is a pretty one, I'll admit, in South Dakota. Uh, and there's a real pretty one. But it looks pretty, why? Because it's little. Everything looks cute when it's little. All right, the problem is they get bigger. And spruce turn ugly at about 20 feet or 20 years. I get calls from people all the time. You know, my trees are looking bad. Uh, what tree do you have? Oh, I have blue spruce. Well, there was a mistake. All right, and they're about 20 feet tall or 20 years old, somewhere in there, 20 to 30, and they say the trees are starting to look bad. Yes, they are. They're already beginning to decline. They're not happy trees. Even our little cultivars are like Montgomery because uh, it's not our winters that get them, it's our summers that get them. Our summers are too hot and too humid. 
Now, that's a pretty looking Colorado spruce, isn't it? That's growing in Colorado, all right? In Colorado, they look a lot nicer. Uh, upper elevations, the summers are cooler, and they're a lot drier. But the problem here, it's so hot, that stresses them, the heat stresses them. And you can water, but you can't cool them. And the humidity in our air just increases all the needle disease. Almost like I say, half my samples come from this tree alone. Uh, you know, that's what they look like in South Dakota. Oh my gosh, look at that poor pathetic tree. They look like the uh, cell towers, you know? Uh, they're just not happy trees here, so let's stay away from them. Cytospora canker kicks into them. Cytospora canker is a fungus disease. We swear they're born with it. Because when you call me, and that's when I'm on campus, of course, when you call me and your trees, your blue screws look like this, they look like this because all those lower branches are infected with a canker disease. And the canker disease is killing them one by one. And you, when I'm out there and I say, well, you know what? I look at the residues and I say, this is cytospora canker. And the next thing you always do is you kind of look around slyly and then say, do you think it came from my neighbor? Oh yeah, your neighbors are at fault for everything. No, I swear they're born with them. They always have. The tree just isn't affected by the canker disease until they start slowing down, which is about age 20. And if you really wanted to start getting this disease, here's the other thing we know. You plant them as a windbreak, and you ought to be planting them 16 feet apart. In the perfect world, you'd plant them 24 feet apart, but you plant them 12 feet apart instead because they look lonely out there. And then they start to touch, and now they're stressed, and they start to die. Spread them out. Right, I'm out. Give them some space, and they'll do a little bit better. So the cytospora canker is killing them at the bottom, and then now, uh, oh, last two weeks I've been cutting spruce trees down on campus. Had to cut one down Friday was the last one I did. 75 feet tall, bottom's dead from cytospora canker, the top's dead from bark beetles. And so we have bark beetles now killing off the top. You ever go around and see these blue spruce, the top 10, 15 feet is dead? It's bark beetles, and they're only really attacking the top. So really, the solution to this is actually a chainsaw and not planting these. But if somebody here says, John, I've got blue spruce, they're about 15, 20 years old, and they're still looking okay, how can I help them? Uh, you have to hire someone to do this, but it's a, it's a product called Canvas App. Uh, C-A-M-B-I-S-T-A-P. Canvas App. And there's really good research to show that it works. Uh, Rainbow Scientific sells the product that uh, you fly by for the last kid. Well, what it is, it's a growth regulator. And what's cool about it is it essentially says, quit growing. And puts all that energy into growing roots. And if you're growing roots, you're surviving. And we've had great success in South Dakota keeping trees looking full. It's the four round, you do it about every three years. But, you know, that is one way to maintain a healthy... Once it's that, there's nothing you can do. It's called chainsaw dying. It's never coming back. But anytime you look in the base of your tree, you see those little resin blisters. It looks like bird, bird droppings on it. That's the start of the canker disease. And you can prune it out, but it just keeps moving up. Right? And again, it's just a problem of being a blue screw. There are some that have fewer of the problems. Uh, Hoopside is actually more heat tolerant than a lot of blue spruce and has that really blue coloration. So if someone said, I have to have a blue spruce, that would be one to plant. But again, my recommendation is to stay away from blue spruce. It has way too many problems. And quit planting scotch pines. Okay. And quit planting Austrian pines. Does anyone know why? I know, this is a depressing talk. I, uh, I thought they were going to have beer here today, all right? <laughs> the guys in the back are going, yeah, that's why, I did. <laughs> why don't we want to plant these two plants anymore? Ah, pine wilt disease. See that? This tree is infected. This is an Austrian pine. The next one isn't. Next year, that's what it looks like. It's going to be. Dr. French first looked at this back in, I think it was 1984 down near, uh, I think it was Austin. And it's, it's, it's a little of a problem that popped up. It's actually a nematode. 
microscopic plant. And it also brings in blue stain fungus. But interestingly enough, this little microscopic roundworm is native to the United States. You can find it in Ponderosa Pine. All right, it's fine. It's always been. Problem is, it's not native to these exotic palms. In China and in Europe, they're scared to death of this thing because it kills things that fast. Here's what happens. You say, call up somebody and say, you know what, it's midsummer, my Scots pine, the needles are starting to turn off color. Or my Austrian pine, the needles are turning off color. Four weeks later, it's dead. I mean, it happens that quick, it shuts it down. So the tree, you know, when someone says, well, I think my tree has pine wilt, and I say, why is that? Well, for the last couple of years, it keeps looking bad. No, 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 no. This would be, spring it look good, fall it's dead. It's that fast. Well, you might be saying, well, I haven't heard about that, or I didn't know it was a problem. And it is, we're cutting trees down left and right on campus. Here's the problem. We didn't have it this far north. Because in order for the nematode to kill the tree, you got to get the mean July temperature above 70 degrees. And you know what's happened? Our summers have been getting warmer. We've seen that problem in Yankton for quite a few years, decades. Now we're seeing it in Watertown. It's moved that far north in South Dakota. Why? Look at that. Our mean July temperatures are getting warmer. And now this is moving north. So. I don't know if it's an issue here yet. I will tell you it'll be an issue here in the future as our summers continue to warm. And so it is off our recommended planting list. Austrian pines and Scots pines are off. Now, we've not seen it yet in Aberdeen, South Dakota. They have not seen it yet in North Dakota. And you sometimes find a nematode, but it really can't cause the disease until you get mean July temperatures above 70. And as it's been getting warmer, it originally, you look 25 years ago, it was only in Yankton. That's as far north as it was for South Dakota. And then it got up to Sioux Falls, then it got up to Brookings, and now it's gotten up to Watertown. All right, and when we find it, when we get communities starting to reach that threshold. So, warm summers could be a problem. Well, we got other things. You didn't plant the tree right. Uh, oh, look at me, I look unhappy there. There's a whole bunch of dead spruce. I've actually taken that one out of the basket, but that was one of the trees. It was already dead, I lifted it, the basket was still on. Now they planted it so the top of the basket was even with the soil. What was the problem? Top of the ball was even with the soil. Well, roots could get out, it's burlap. They come too deep in the ball. When I took that ball apart, first root was six inches down. You know, and Gary Johnson at the University of Minnesota speaks on this a lot. And as he points out, when you're planting B and B stock, it already comes too deep in that ball sometimes. You've got to find where that first root is. He just pushes a, a little rod down there and you plant it at that depth, not to the top of the ball. And some of you my age would remember that was the gospel. You plant it at the top of the ball. That's what we told everybody in 1970. What's changed since 1970 now? Well, lots of things. But in terms of this, back then I had a job, and my job was hand digging trees and being beans. Okay? It was a great job. <laughs> it convinced me to go to college. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Nowadays, this is done by machine. And when it's done by machine, they end up putting soil on top of the ball, and then you dig it. So you might say, well, they, they didn't tell me that before. They didn't tell me that a long time ago. Or you find old extension material. They won't mention this, but now everything's machined up. And so they end up too deep in that ball now where before we hand dug them. But hand digging, we could do 20 a day. Now they can do 200 a day with the machine. So nobody's hand digging it. Oh, this has become the real problem in South Dakota. More for windbreaks than anything else. Those are cedars, junipers. And they're all dying and they're about 10 years old. And that's the call I'll get. Gee, my cedar trees are dying and my windbreak, they're all about 10 years old. I already know the problem before I get out. Does anyone know what the problem is? Why are they dying? Biggest problem we're having right now in South Dakota. It's the fabric. Fabric's killing them. 
Remember that fabric that goes into windbreaks, and fabric is a great idea. It really is. But what happens is that little slit you make, and you pull up the seedling through it, under cedars and spruce, those are the two. That fabric is shaded. It's never exposed to ultraviolet light. It never starts degrading. So 10 years later, I'll find that fabric and you'll pull all the debris on top and it will look like new. And you can't pull it out of the trunk of the tree anymore. And it kills it. And it's become, it's become so much of a problem in the Dakotas is our conservation districts now have machines that'll go through and rip out the fabric for you. It's not a problem on your deciduous trees because those are exposed to sunlight and that breaks down the fabric enough that it tears as the tree expands. But on spruce and on cedars that stay branched to the ground, no light gets there. So that fabric is just as tough as the day you put it in. And so what they do now is their machine goes down the road, cuts it in half, and just pulls the whole thing off for you. And this is a lot of work. But here's, here's a real important tip. Do that at age five, because you don't need the fabric anymore once it's been in for five years. It can tolerate the competition. Don't do it at age 10. Because if you go out and pull the fabric out, when it's been down there for 10 years and we have a dry summer, you'll kill every cedar. The reason being, by that point, all the roots are right at the surface. You pull that off, it's a dry summer, the roots just dry out and die. Do it at about age five. And then the roots are still fairly deep and the plant will come out of it. But we have to warn people on these all the time. I like fabric, don't get me wrong. Fabric is really valuable to reduce competition, but after five years, you don't need the fabric anymore. It's done its job. And when fabric first came out, they told us that it would break down, all right? Yeah, if it's an oak tree where you're getting all the sunlight down there, but not on cedars. And we plant a lot of cedars in the Dakotas and spruce. Those are the two I'll find occasionally a pine. And that, but it's become such a big problem. We do this at every district talk. Get the fabric out. Uh, I mean, there's nothing worse than uh, having that. You know, there, it was just girdling some trees and killed some others. Uh, that had been there for 12 years. What was the only solution? I said, do you have any teenage boys? <laughs> yeah, three. I said, get, give them all carpet knives. And now they got something to do for two weeks. And you literally crawl underneath there and cut every one. By the way, we have rattles. Oh, and then staking it. What's wrong with this tree? What do you see? Always happens on spruce. That's a blue spruce, so who cares? <laughs> All right. What's the problem with that? What do you, you notice the color change right there where I have that arrow? I go, oh, I know what happened to that tree. And I went up close to it and I go, yep, I'm right. And then we had an April snowstorm a few years ago. Snapped the top right out of it. Why do you think it snapped it right there, right at the color change? There was a rubber hose and wire still embedded in the tree. <laughs> People forget it on Converse because you can't see it anymore. You know, when I saw it there, you couldn't pull it out anymore, so it was like, fine, I'll leave it as a good example. Um, and sure enough, it came out. So, yeah, wash your tree. But it's a spruce, isn't it? Well, guess what? We have other pests other than us. Uh, Diplodia tip light on, on your Austrian pines and ponderosa pines has become a real problem. Why does it become a real problem? We got a lot of old Austrian pines and Ponderosa pines. And again, it's very humid here. This disease has really come about the last about four or five decades. But on, on our two major pines, you ever notice that? The needles are just hanging there. This is a tip line. It infects the tips. You can spray for it, but you're going to spray for it every year. You'll never cure the tree. So you spray for it for maybe six years, and then you quit for another six, then you go back to spraying. All right, it's a tough thing to manage, and that's what you do. You'll often see the recommendations pick up all the fallen cones. Anyone know why? Why, do, why does the extension material say pick up all the fallen cones? Because that's where the disease overwinters. Also the infected tip. All right, the only person that should pick up all, all the fallen cones at this time of year is a retired guy that has nothing else to do with his life. All right, if you say, I have nothing to live for and I don't fish, apparently, all right, go out and pick up the cones because it doesn't do any good. 
All right, let's let's say a couple of you retired guys. All right, because I'm envious of you. All right, said okay, we're gonna go through Morse and we're gonna pick up every column. And he did that. We picked up every column. And then as I left town here today, I took a cone I brought from South Dakota and just lobbed it in the middle of town. It's as though he did nothing. Yeah, so, yeah. So don't pick up the cone, unless you just have nothing else to do. And then we have a needle blight, too. This, this kills needles. The other one kills tips. And this disease showed up about 30 years ago, really, and has become progressively worse. Uh, this is where you get the banding on the needle. Red banding, it's also called. This can be managed well, but it takes sprays in the spring, two or three sprays every year. So these get to be fairly high maintenance plants. You get a 50 foot tall tree, that's a lot of spraying to get to the top. And then spruce, they all get needle caps diseases. Right? And we now have two needle caps diseases. And the reason they get the needle caps diseases are summers are too humid. Right? It's perfect for them. And you've got to spray these every year twice. If you get a conifer, just buy a pressure spray. All right? Because you'll use a lot of it once they mature. First 20 years, you're good. All right. Oh, and spider mites. What's the problem with spider mites? They get blamed for everything. Everybody says that, well, it's spider mites. You know what? Spider mites are actually the rarity causing the problem. I can always find a spider mite or two. Kind of like finding um, yes, they can cause problems, but uh, usually they're just there causing a little bit of problem. It's usually one of the needle caps diseases causing bigger problems, or cytopsis cancer. And that, so again, it's, it's the easy thing. Oh, it's spider mites, I'll spray for that. First of all, there's nothing a homeowner can buy anymore that you spray spider mites for and it works. And there's a lot of things you can buy that actually makes the problem worse. Uh, a lot of our sprays, Tempo and such, we spray for mosquitoes. It kills everything that eats the mites, so the mites do better. All right, well, I gotta finish on a happy note. So what else should we try? And, and this is what we should try. Not that I know these will perform extremely well in Morris area or, or Alexandria, but just that based upon what we have in the Dakotas, yeah, worth a try. Subalpine fir, now you say, wait a minute, John, you're talking about a fir tree. This fir tree is native to Montana. And to me, I like the color. Uh, that picture I took at the Minnesota Landscape Arbory, they have some nice ones there. We have them growing up in Jamestown and Fargo, North Dakota, and they're doing just beautifully. And by growing there, I mean slightly out of town, too. So would I plant a whole row of these? No, but I certainly would give them a try. They have a kind of a nice color that we all want. They don't get very big, and who cares about that? You know, 25 feet, we're good. And if you fall into one, they're soft. So they got everything you want, and the only problem you're going to have is really our winters and our summers. But so far, this one seems to do well because it's from Montana. Uh, there's a picture of one I took in Montana. All right, looks pretty nice. And if you say, John, I just have room for a little tree in my backyard, ooh, the dwarf blue subalpine fir. All right, that's a cultivar that is, I mean, 15 feet. I mean, if you said, yeah, I want a bluish little, little tree in my yard. And if I lived in Morris, I'd have no problems with this one. Uh, again, outside of town, yeah, try it. But we don't have enough of them out there to know how they do. They do very well in the Twin Cities, but again, that's a heat island. But again, I like to get some furs out here too, uh, just because it adds to our diversity. Douglas fur gets a question mark. I can show you magnificent Douglas fir in this area in the north, and I can show you ones that are flat out dead. And it depends on the seed source. If the seed source is from the Rocky Mountain region, Montana and that, they do very well. If it's from the southern part of the range, they don't do very well. So what you want to do is buy Rocky Mountain Douglas fir when you're planting. Rocky Mountain Douglas fir, because that's from farther north, it's from Montana. And then they'll do well. We even have them growing in, in uh, Lemon, South Dakota, if you know where that is. I mean, that's uh, for a tree, that's where you go if you did something bad in previous life. It is not a real great growing area. But the Rocky Mountain one is a good there. And we have very few pest problems, again, other than winter burn if you selected one from a southern seed source. But it's a tree that we're really trying to get more out there. And in Serbian spruce, 
Question mark. That's an in-town only trip. It will not take your winter winds to a great degree. So if you've got protection in town, they actually do very well. Uh, but out in the country, they tend to just winter burn so bad, you'll just be dropping needles. But I love this tree. I mean, you say it's a spruce, but I love it. It doesn't seem to get the disease problems or other spruce does. And it's an unusual spruce that has a flat needle rather than a four-sided needle. So it actually looks more like a fir tree. And these have done extremely well, again, in town by Sio Marica. Uh, then those are the needles, nice white hand. And then my personal favorite, so you're going to get some bias here, is Meyer spruce. I first liked Meyer spruce when I was you know, traveling across Mongolia. And there they have what they call canyon forests, forests that go down into the draws. And you get out there in the prairie, and this is about the last spruce you find. You don't usually find spruce in prairie environments, but this one is. It's native to China, actually from an area that's climatically similar to eastern South Dakota, western Minnesota. Hot summers, cold winters, strong winds. It's got everything we've got, including soils. And this tree has actually performed fairly well. Uh, it can look as blue as a blue spruce. And the way you tell them apart is, I say shake hands with them. If you grab a branch and grab the needles on a blue spruce, it hurts. It's prickly. These have blunt needles soft. And when I've gone out and looked at people's Meyer spruce that are declining because of cytosporic canker, they actually had blue spruce instead. Somebody just sold them the wrong tree. It's hard to find these. Our conservation districts have them, but here's the problem with them. Blue spruce will grow about a foot a year. This grows less than a foot a year. It might only be eight inches a year. Maybe two-thirds, three-fourths the height. So some nurseries say we don't want to spend the extra time growing them up a little bit older. Lots of people, you're all looking for speed. This isn't speed. But if you're willing to take a tree that's going to grow a little slower, you're going to get a tree that actually is much better adapted to our, our area than the Colorado blue spruce. I like the needles. They are just nice and soft. I can show you ones that are just as blue as can be. The other way you can tell apart from blue spruce is the cone. That's the cone to it. Looks like a big white spruce cone, a little bit longer. Uh, blue spruce cone has a little groove in it. But I will tell you one problem with this tree. Uh, I'm going to show you a tree and a windbreak that has been in that windbreak for eight years. Old row. They called me and said, John. Deer. Deer love them. They have a soft needle. <laughs> and this was a windbreak. Right next to it was a whole bunch of cedars. Well, you got winter cover right there for them. And they'll browse these. They'll never get bit. Uh, apparently, they're not really nutritious. But, you know, I haven't talked to deer. I'm just talking about wildlife biologists. <laughs> Uh, deer don't seem to mind them. Maybe they're kind of like candy farm for all I know, but uh, they'll browse them and you'll have a row that looks like little hassles. All right, if you want perfectly round plants, you'll have that. In town, they're not as much of a problem. I mean, they're not the favorite browse. Not like when you plant one here, they're going to come in and find it. But if you use them as a windbreak and you have a lot of deer pressure, uh, they'll, never, it's, they'll never get the size or what you'll see is they keep getting browsed and one, one stem got above it somehow. And you'll see this little hassock with a pole sticking out. Uh, so I'll put that in as a concern. So that's the talk. I know this is a lunchtime talk. And so I figured people had to scoot. So I wanted to make sure I got done early. And I'm not in a real rush to leave. My students would, wouldn't mind if I hung around here before. four. Uh, but I do have to scoot a little bit, but I want to make sure we have time for questions. So does anybody have any questions just dealing with conifers, not the debate last night? I have nothing on that. <laughs> yes, sir. So I, I got some blue spruce that are 35 years old that are you know, really pretty nice. I you know, pruned some up from the bottom. Yep. So, you know, maybe to six feet. Okay. The worst ones. Yeah. So what do I replace them with and what, you know, what do I look for in the future? Okay.
Okay, so he's got 35 foot tall blue spruce that are dying the lower six branches. You prune those off. What do you do? Well, keep in mind, you can plant blue spruce back there again, and it'll look good for 20, 30 years. All right, so you could always do that and just figure a replacement. I know landscape architects that consider those 20 year now trees. All right. The other is what's the function of those trees? Are they out in the country getting hit by winds? Are they in town? What's what do they do for you? They're about the wind windbreak, but they've got they've got some uh, elm maples and cherry oh, okay. and those guys. And, and all the other trees are the road kind of going on. So if you didn't mind the slower speed and you could deal with the pressure, I would try Myers spruce. I mean we've planted those in some pretty harsh environments in South Dakota and they've come through, they take droughts fairly well. And so that's the one. My fallback though is always white spruce. Black hill spruce we know it as. If you say, John, I want to plant a spruce that deer really don't chew on, that's tough, black hill spruce is it. And so that's always my fallback. I would always plant that over the uh, uh, Colorado spruce. You do not see them the same disease problem. Good. Yes, sir. No, uh, I got uh, pretty well protected uh, places where I've got white pine. Yeah. But you, you don't have that. They don't plant the white pine out where they're exposed to the wind. Exactly. They can winter burn severely. And then uh, I, also, I also have Norway spruce, and they seem to be, you know, tolerated pretty much. Well, yeah. As long as they got some protection. Yeah. But. Out in the out in the middle of the windbreak, we see those will occasionally winter burn, and we've had top snap out of them. In uh, the uh, Scottish pine, yeah, had my grandfather planted them, and uh, they are actually uh, spreading out in the, in the hills. Yeah, feed, feed themselves in the midwinter forest out of out of them. And we see that too, that people that have planted uh, Scots pines and you know, in kind of a, you know, 10 acres or even smaller, they will actually seed in the surrounding prairie around them. And you'll get a colony of them. I love Scots pine. I mean, it's a tough tree for our area. Uh, it will tolerate our summers, our winters. I think they're picturesque. Though I did have one crazy call uh, back in when the millennium came in South Dakota, they were looking for the oldest tree. I, I think somebody thought we'd have a tree thousands of years old. So I did chase down trees. People said, well, my tree's the oldest tree. And what they call it, be a cotton with this big. Oh, it's got to be six, seven hundred years old. Now nah, more like 60 at this point. But my favorite was a farm that called me up and said, we've got a 500 year old pine tree. And I went out there and I said, it's a Scots pine. Well, yeah, it's a Scots pine. 500 years old in South Dakota. What happened? The Vikings just planted it when they stopped over here and coffee a little bar. <laughs> All right, it's not native. And I love the tree. My only concern, again, it is it's the favorite food for the pinewood hemlock. And what you typically find is you lose all your Scots pine, and then you lose your Austrian pine, and then your native pines are left. And so, you know, as it's moving north, I just put that as a caution. I wouldn't invest a lot in Scots pines just because you may lose them now. There is a treatment. Here's the problem with the treatment. It's about 60% effective and it's outrageously expensive. And the bigger the tree, the less effective it is. And that's the ones you tend to protect. And I know companies that have quit treating trees just because they said, I ain't taking money from people and they do the treatments and the trees don't die. So again, it's unfortunate, but we're probably going to lose that tree from the landscape as they have in Nebraska. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Does that spread to other varieties like Colorado or Black No, it does not. Uh, the Plodia tip light affects Ponderosa pine and Austrian pine. Those are the two pines that are affected. Um, and again, on um, both of them, it tends to be a problem more on the older trees, the trees that are stressed and not doing as well. Uh, you come onto our campus, every pine that's, every pine rose is in Austria that's, well, every pine rose we're losing the Austrian, uh, that are about 50 years plus have this blight. And one of the other things you'll find with the blight is the top of the tree will still be green, but the rest will be affected because the spores tend to rain down from it. 
I mean, you can spray for it, and the sprays are effective. It's just the fact you got to spray them twice every year. You need to spray them for about at least three years, so six applications, and then you're going to wait another three years and spray them again, and that just goes on forever. Yeah, I'm looking at you. We have windbreaks all around our farm. We plant it 800 times a week, and they're mostly Black Hill spruce and Colorado spruce, and <coughs> there have been some blue spruce in there that weren't mortared, but yeah. In there. Well, Colorado and Blue Spruce are the same tree, just a different name. Well, half of the upright branch ones are green and oh, yeah. about six or seven are blue. Right. And actually, they've done marvelous things. Well, how old are they? Um, 40. 40 and they're doing well still? Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. I mean, that truly is. We get that. You know, there's some Blue Spruce I'll find out that are 60 years old. Uh, and doing well, but that is unusual, I'll say. So keep your fingers crossed. And the greens, we've had a few die, but that was my question. You said the Black Hill spruce, you know, the deep crowns and everything, they have the more drooping. Yes, pattern. right, very good. Yeah, a little more drooping. Yeah. And it's not that they have no problems, they have just far fewer problems than yeah. Colorado spruce. Well, at some point, because they are 40, and we have lost uh, one here and there. Yeah. Uh, when we come to replace them, would a guy go with all Black Hill spruce? Well, you know, you asked a great question here because I always hate to see something as a we're just going to use one plant. Uh, I would, uh, if you don't have the deer pressure, yeah, I, we do. Okay, then Myers is out, otherwise, you got candy for him. Um, then what I would try is the Black Hill spruce, of course, put that in there, but can you put a pine in there? Kind of like a ponderosa or that. Oh, ponderosa is a nightmare. Yeah, that's a problem with it. Uh, I mean, but we'll, when we get the spruce, you're really down to one tough one, and that's Black Hill. So I'm afraid that's your best choice. Okay, thanks. Question there, Mindy. Uh, I'm sent here by my wife to find out whether I have to replant 14 arborvitae. A year ago, I trimmed them back decrease the size, but also last winter we had one weekend of minus 34.4. Yeah. Is it my trimming or is it the cold temperature that resulted in 50% green canopy within within the tree? I don't see any other arborvitae in town that got hit by the 34 degrees. And so my trimming must have done something to them that uh, resulted in this patchy regrowth. Okay, now, we'll all go with it's the winner, not you, all right? We all good for that? <laughs> all right, because we're sticking together for the poor guy. I hate to say it, but yeah, you caused the problem. Uh, our providers do not respond well to deep pruning. They should be lightly sheared. When you start cutting deeper on them, and I see people do that, they come out very patchy. Now, the winter didn't help, I will admit that. We did lose some stuff from that, so I will say it's a combination of the two. And when did you do that, Sherry? What month of the year? It was in October. So oh! <laughs> jumping out this window right now. All right. You don't want to do it then. And, then it, and it was four to five inches into the canopy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you own some of that. All right, the winter well, didn't I, help. I own all of it now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, as far as we're all concerned in this room, it was the winter. But uh, for our body, we always had that don't, don't shear them after August. We don't want to do anything too late because what you can do is shearing is actually something that can delay dormancy a little bit. And so you actually may have kept them from going as deep in dormancy as you could and combine that with an exceptionally cold winter. The combination, and I seriously mean combination, mild winter, you might not have seen the same effect from it, uh, but also shearing them deeply can create more wounding and create more problems as well. I mean, the problem with arbor body is you're really, in the ideal world, you shear them a little every year rather than shear them occasionally. You cut them too deeply. Okay. You got I had um, arbor body, just for your information, that was um, right along the highway, Highway 28. Mm -hmm. And I lost almost a dozen of them, not this last spring, but spring before I noticed they were all 
almost all of them did. So I replanted them before this wonderful, and now I wish I wouldn't have. So well, now what'd you plant? I planted more arborvitae. Well, that's okay. Oh, I mean, I'm not, if you're right next to Highway 28, well, I don't think that was a very good idea. It probably wasn't, but let's try to make some lemonade out of it. Uh, My yeah, lemonade is I'm going to plant something in front of it. So well, there you go. So have any chemicals <coughs> going on to the arborvitae. Yeah, and that's the real problem. They do not right. like, and so you can wash them off in the spring, but that may not be doable for you. Well, it's going to be, it's okay. going to have to be. But and and, and here's the other happen. problem with the de-icing salts is people say, well, we're not going to use uh, sodium chloride, we're going to use calcium chloride, or we're going to use something else. It's the chloride that causes the problem. So as long as they got the word chloride in the whatever the ice and salt they're using, the problem is, and highways make it worse, right. because what they did is they tracked the speed, and what happens is that salt that dries in the spring, you've all seen that kind of glaze on a little bit, and the drive down road picks that up and the turbulence carries it out of the foliage. So it's really the spring, it's the air. Yeah, that's the problem with the arbor. Well, and that's exactly what happened. It looked good in the spring. Yep. By summer, if I would have taken and washed it down, yeah. it would have been fine. Or when we have the years where we have an incredibly wet spring and it washes them off naturally, we have less of a problem. But you're right, it's. I should have washed it down. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Or, or get rid of salt butter. Just close the roads. Master gardeners need to know things too. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, what is your recommendation uh, when planting a farm windbreak, um, planting blackwood, spruce, conifers, or pine, as far as distance Ooh, and yeah. you plant them apart? Planting uh, for the future. Yeah. I mean, 16 feet by minimum. I know. Nobody likes that. Well, you said 24. Well, that's what I really like. 16 is my minimum. I'll negotiate that. Uh, the problem is everybody wants to do eight or 12, and the problems occur too early. 24 is perfect, because then you can get them to mature and they flush out and live a lot longer. 16 is what I'll accept, and the reason I say I'll accept is some of the cost share programs have a requirement that there's spacing, and you can't get cost share if you go to 24. And everybody says, well, I'll plant them at 12 and I'll take out every other one. Nobody ever does that. Uh, they call me when they've grown into each other, so at least give me 16. 